one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Blankship. Anybody have any questions on the agenda? All right, Mr. Oldham, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Any, any, nothing on the consent agenda then that anyone had, right? Okay. Just a lot of major purchases for Spirit Creek High School. It is. And, and some things we bid each year, too. There you know, would be not only Stewart's Creek, but another school that may be asking for the same thing. Okay, and Holloway will do our spotlight on education. And our other one was, first thing we had after that was insurance of 365. Do you all want to wait on Ms. Nolan, or do you want to go ahead and discuss it some now, or whatever you'd like to do? Mr. Hodge, I'd be. I'd, I'd, wait, I'd wait on her. Let's wait on Ms. Nolan if that's okay. Okay. Okay, number nine is partner with Better World Books. The instruction department is requesting permission to partner with Better World Books to dispose of our used library books. Better World Books handles all aspects of inventorying, marketing, selling, and shipping. Bedford County Board of Education receives a commission or Ingram credit. Ingram Book Company is what we're talking about. Any books deemed unsaleable are donated to their literacy partners or recycled. In partnership with libraries and colleges, Better World Books has raised over $10 million for libraries and literacy partners and recycled over 67 million books. And the motion will be to partner with Better World Books for the disposal of our used library books. This is new. We have not done this before, but we're recommending that. Any questions? <clears throat> Mr. The money that's raised from our participation, does that stay in? Here. It does. Well, uh, we get our commission part out of that for turning them in. Now, you do not know when, say, a school puts a box of books together until they go through with it to see if it's something that's sellable or whatever it is. So what Jeff is basically going to do is we'll take the total amount back that we receive from this and divide that for new library books over those schools that submitted books. I mean, to try to divide it equitably as it can back into library books. Jeff, do I need to add anything to that? Yeah, that's it, Mr. Number 10. Number 10 is Textbook Adoption Report ED 5099 and Textbook Certificate of Adoption Report ED 2153. School systems are required to submit textbook adoptions annually on forms provided by the Tennessee Department of Education. All textbooks are adopted on a six-year cycle. The local textbook adoption report shows newly adopted textbooks for 2013, and textbook adoptions includes elementary reading, which is uh, uh, readiness one through grade six, and recommend approval motion to approve the textbook adoption ED 5099 and the certificate of adoption report ED 2153 as presented. Would it be appropriate Thursday, I mean, tomorrow night, <laughs> tomorrow night, to remind the public how these textbooks are selected statewide and then how they are selected district-wide. We can do that. If you uh, like. I think it's like. just a, a good piece of information. Uh, I think we've had some people appear before us in the past that just did not understand that process. Okay. And Mr. Odom, there is a textbook advisory committee that is our own local committee, is that correct? It is. And how is that committee appointed? That committee is appointed basically with people in instruction. It's uh, teachers, and this year there was a parent who was involved in it that looked over it. So it's mostly people that are teaching materials, familiar with the Tennessee's SPI, student performance indicators, because you're trying to get your alignment lined up with what you teach. To, hopefully you're taking a lot of individual work from teachers having to go out and find something to teach. The closer your alignment, the, the easier it is for teachers to, to be able to teach that alignment. The problem in elementary school, which is different really than high, is those people teach six or seven different subjects, stop and think, because they're self-contained classrooms. So they're doing math, reading, science, social studies, um, and then in some cases an art or something like that in addition. So. We certainly strive to try to get it as close as we can with the standards that are that are coming. So, this is the committee's recommendation. 
you mentioned that this year that committee has a parent mm -hmm. on it that's not typical it's not required it hadn't been always it hasn't been but Ms. Jennings was on it this year I believe I'm on it. Number 11. Number 11 is textbook report for kindergarten readiness reading adoption. And there's not a book per se for them. Um, recommendation Houghton Mifflin Splash into pre K program. And the kit cost is $2,499 per teacher. Currently, there are 17 teachers teaching kindergarten readiness. And the motion is to approve pre K program kits as presented. So they, they do not, you don't buy a textbook every year or anything like that. This would be kind of over your six year adoption cycle. Any questions? Number 12. Number 12. And I probably will not try to read all the Spanish names, okay? <laughs> textbook adoption for a book not on the state list. Form ED 5196, local adoption of textbooks not on contract. The instruction department is requesting approval for local adoption of textbooks not on contract in the rules and regulation of minimum standards for which no textbooks is included in the official list of textbooks under section 1.02 program selection. It says recommend approval motion for Rutherford County to request approval for local adoption of textbooks not on contract in the rules and regulations minimum standards for which no textbook is included in the official list of textbooks under section 1.02 program selection the following books are to be adopted for the next six years and the first one is an advanced placement Spanish literature and culture and that is the book selected the next one was advanced placement French language and culture and the third one is be Ruffin County's first time the Bible its influence by Ship Stetson published in the Bible Literacy Project 2011 second edition and that I asked be in number for the Bible. We will have two high schools next year. We offered it as a, an elective course offering. And so two schools, it actually was Laverne High and Blackman High, students signed up for this course. It'll be the first time for Wilson County for an elective course. Um, this book's been vetted quite a bit. It's been used at other places. We, Wilson County's done it for a number of years. And I'll talk more um, as a... Um, literature as uh, some history art and that sort of thing from that particular angle but this this is a state course code number so it, it's been around for a little while so what's the uh, teaching qualifications social studies it's accredited in social studies so basically but the principals have talked with people who uh, would be willing to do that it's not much they're going to say you go in and teach it but someone that they feel comfortable with and understand the parameters. I, I, would, I would think clearly that, that uh, <clears throat> would be a very important step in important selection. It is. To do because it, it, there, can be, there can be some lines that are going to be mm -hmm. questioned mm -hmm. without how they all do it. But, uh, it's interesting. But it is an elected course. Sure. So students can choose to take it or not to take it. And it's not required. So. But it gives you one more credit in social studies if you're interested. Number 13. 13 is the Eagleville High School City Sewer Connection. Director of Schools, Mr. Don Odom, has received a letter from Eagleville Mayor Sam Tune requesting an impact connection fee of 70000 and a monthly billing of 4000 The fee and the monthly billing is equivalent to billing and fee paid at other school locations. Rutherford County Schools Construction and Engineering Department is also working with Jamie Reed at Site Engineering, design engineer for the project to install a pipe from the new plant back to the sports complex at Eagleville High School so repurified water can be used to irrigate the sports complex, creating water savings. The funds for the impact fee in the construction of Eagleville High School to prep for the new system connection will be included in the 2013-14 capital improvements budget and that whole amount is estimated to be 250000 And the motion is to approve City of Eagle sewer impact connection fee and monthly billing as presented. And Mr. Clardy has been working on that. If you'd like to ask some questions, we'll do that. We use a re-purified re, uh, at Siegel now, that complex was approved several years ago. <coughs> With that, um, I think he's negotiated down the monthly fee by about $1,000. Yeah. So, so. Laura? 
the uh, system that we presently have between the house, between the gym, the older the old gym and the uh, uh, football field, will what will happen to that? Will it just sit there, or will we disassemble? So will there actually need to be a structure there, or will it be underground? Uh, or? There will be a fenced-in area, but it will be a closed system. And also, uh, we're investigating putting in a larger tank, another large tank, to receive repurified water back from the sewer plant to uh, water the ball fields out there. So that will be a huge savings. With the new uh, with the new sewer connection, uh, there'll be a lot less aromatic out out there at football games and other. Uh, the aroma over the years has been pretty uh, pungent, if you will. So that'll be be nice to to have that out of the way. <laughs> yes, sir. Anybody else? Yeah, I just think this is a good good thing. We just need. Continue looking at other schools and see what other things we can do to. to uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I wasn't here. I, I was just saying, I think this is a good move, and we just need to look at other opportunities to see what other schools we can implement something like this at other locations. So. They, uh, the other, the only other school that we need help on right now is Whitworth. I mean Buchanan Elementary School. And uh, we actually already have design done on the system out there, but we swapped Eagleville around and bumped it out a year and moved Eagleville into the spot on capital improvement this year. So next year, we'll get Buck Hanna. Good job. Anybody else? 13B. 13B is energy management grant proposal. We, we are approached by energy management companies from time to time. And you can go with an energy management company that does this nationally and they, any savings, you're supposed to, to, they get a percentage of that, but it's their calculations that do. Mr. Clardy has been able to apply for a grant to cover the cost where we can do a lot of this management and tracking ourselves which means you do not have to pay back anything to some other company but anyway this is the proposal the energy efficient school council eesc has allocated one hundred sixty seven thousand and sixty dollars to rutherford county schools to establish an ongoing energy management program the four minimum criteria for this grant are board adopted energy management conservation policy that includes protection of indoor environmental quality Establishing a baseline of at least one year of historical utility data and benchmarking utility data on Energy Star Portfolio Manager for a number of schools that will account for at least 50% of the total square footage at the, and uh, our total district is about 8 million square feet. Contract ASHRAE Level 1 adults with CEM or BEAP on a number of schools that will account for at least 10% of the total square footage and establish an energy action plan that identifies roles and responsibilities, including an energy management advocate for the district. Rutherford County Schools proposes to use the grant to fulfill these minimum criteria, and with the remaining grant allocation, demonstrate the ability to collect and organize real-time energy and facility data and use software to provide intelligence to an energy manager position hired by Rutherford County Schools that result in measuring measurable energy efficiencies. The energy management system in the first year of the energy manager salary will be submitted for reimbursement under the grant. Rutherford County Schools will also receive training under the grant, including training on four building surveys to review operation and maintenance of mechanical systems and controls, training in energy management intelligence software, training and understanding of ISHRAE 
audits and training to understand ROI of energy conservation activities. Redford County Schools has selected professional services of the Mechanical Resource Group, MRG, under this grant. Ron Graham, the General Manager of Energy Service Mechanical Resource Group, LLC, will be here tomorrow night to go over the proposal in detail with the Redford County School Board. Uh, the motion will be to approve the proposal from Mechanical Resource Group to help apply and qualify for EESC grant of $167,060 with $64,918 going to hire an energy manager for the first year. The future salary for the energy manager will, will come from any utility savings. Um, and Mr. Cardi can certainly talk to you about that. We discussed it extensively, but I think, I think step up and let them talk to you about it because I think there's some potential here for us. Also, uh, we have Ron Graham scheduled tomorrow night to uh, do a brief presentation concerning the entire program. And uh, Ron was the director of EESI uh, for from the concept through this past year. And now uh, there's a gentleman there, his name is Paul Cross from Murfreesboro who is taking that position over and Ron, Ron retired. So he understands all the requirements. This program over the past four years, we've worked hard to get to this point. So uh, this just moves everything to the next level that we need to be out to realize any other savings uh, that are out there in our energy consumption. And uh, we have the opportunity to participate in Internoc, which is a TVA program that helps us lower our peak values, that sets a rate for our energy uh, that we buy from uh, in Middle Tennessee and the other electric company, where uh, it's kind of a brownout situation where they will contact us, for instance, if Nissan needs extra power during the day and we can cut back our consumption um, in the late afternoon maybe at 2.30 or something right before schools are getting out so they can use that power somewhere else and our peak energy, peak demand will come down which will lower our entire bill plus uh, TVA will pay us for that power that they use during that period so we hope to realize some money in that respect also. Is there a question? I, I guess I'm just not very bright. I hadn't figured it out, but I trust you, Mr. Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We worked pretty hard to get to this point. Well, I, I, I do. I mean, you know, I, you, you kind of identified the, the benefits. And we've seen other conservation programs that we've used and have done exactly that. I think it's extraordinary that we pursue these things I'm glad that we are I'm, do you have any idea in mind dollars and cents wise what you think it can produce for us um, I kind of hate to say anything because I don't want to come up short sure but uh, I'd say that we could save at least 150,000 to 250,000 a year off the TVA deal plus um, with the energy manager, we may save that much more. And uh, so we definitely want to pay for his salary and benefits every year, plus have some money left over. <coughs> so uh, if you recall the policy, it says that that will be shared to put back into the system, a percentage of it will. So we want to put that back into, so we can monitor other systems, other schools, buildings, and uh, put the correct telemetry and things on there so we can manage that power. So is this thing, um, as we save money, put it back in there and create more savings in other buildings that we're not currently have on the, the uh, computer systems? I've already admitted I probably wouldn't be able to figure it out if it didn't work out for us, so. <laughs> well, at least we will know how much we're saving. Sure. And it won't be a question of someone else coming in here with a figure and say, I saved you 
a half million dollars this year and I want 450,000 of it. There's kind of no, yeah. really no way to tell. Yeah. But we'll know from that standpoint ourselves. We've already pursued some conservation efforts with lighting and uh, water conservation. You mentioned the cooperation with TVA and the power sharing. Will we get into the possibilities of any type of green power production or anything like that with the uh, open uh, real estate that the schools occupy? Uh, there's a possibility right now that's very expensive. The payback on it is, takes too long to make it profitable or return on the investment. Um, what we want to do is, through this process, is make sure that the energy that we're using, we're using it as efficient as we can, and we don't uh, have rooms overheated or overcooled, those types of things, so we can monitor that. But also we can hope to be able to investigate other ways. Um, I went up to Kentucky a couple times and looked at systems they had up there, and they're putting in roof panels that are solar uh, panels and it's so expensive to store the stuff, so instead of using it, it goes back into the grid to pay for the power that they're pulling off the grid. So, um, and it's still expensive to do that, but there's some opportunities, I think, but you gotta have someone that's dedicated and knowledgeable to watch that every minute of every day. Would you anticipate that this new position would not only be monitoring and reporting on these things, but also possibly take up the responsibility of writing new grant requests and such for these type of situations? Yes, I think so. And, uh, there, you know, the Internoc deal, for instance, we've been approached over, you know, the last three years to do that, and we could have done it, but it would have been a failure because we just didn't have anyone that can make sure that, the, you know, that it stays online and if we there's certain criteria that you have to meet and if you don't meet it then you don't get kicked off the program but you just don't get paid for it so we want to make sure that we're meeting the criteria when we go into those programs being able to do this with a grant is a very good thing absolutely you know give this a try and there'll be some more money through the esi as uh, I sit on that council and several other people from the area do, so there'll be some more money available for us as the loans that we originally made to all the systems throughout the state come back in. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, before we go to number 14, Ms. Nova? You want to speak now or you want to wait? I'm you sure? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to number 14. Okay, number 14, I think, was, was asked to place on it coaching supplements. You should have in your packet what we per currently pay for coaching supplements, and uh, it's roughly $1.9 I think is what Jeff said about what it cost us annually. So I'm not sure who has to put that on there or what the discussion with that's. I, I made the request to do so. I've been contacted by someone, and uh, the, the information that I was given to check on is was either misinterpreted by me or inaccurate because I see the supplement there that I want to check. So I think it's good to put eyes on it for sure. Uh, I'm certainly not any 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 preparation to, to ask for any changes specifically right now, but I would like for all of us as board members to take a look at it and see if there are things that we need to to suggest a change in some particular way and add or whatever it might be. And uh, I just I just anxious to put some eyes on it and see and as I say I unless I've misinterpreted something it's what I was going to ask for is not not going to need to be asked for. I might say about this sheet well, if it says a system 
coach. Uh, in some cases, schools will take and say, say you have one allocation there of 10, 11%. Some schools will take and two people will do it at half each, which we do not keep them from doing, but the total cost to you remains the same if one person gets it or if they decide to divide that among two people. This used to be negotiated as part of the contract annually. I might should know the answer to this. This is kind of here, but not. Well, I know we have a volunteer or other assistants that are there that, there's, that are paid through other funding and so forth. What's the limit in football, for example? How many people through TWSAA are they allowed to have? Does anyone know? I can answer that. Yeah. Okay. We had a meeting about four years ago to go over the procedures for volunteer coaches, and at that time we set limits to the number of volunteers that could participate with each sport based on TWSAA guidelines. And for football, it was three volunteers to actually help so assist that's beyond the, the that's beyond five this. assistants so correct head coach five assistants three more so correct nine staff correct. and even if they don't want to be paid they're not allowed to have that tenth person that's correct participate and we track those when we when when you approve volunteer <laughs> coaches we track those on a spreadsheet to make sure we don't exceed the allowable number for any sport okay. Okay. now excuse me Ms. Barnes. Ms. Barnes. Ms. Barnes. Oh, I'm sorry. Let, let me ask you that. Uh, you say coaches now, uh, do you, in assistant coaches, do you track statisticians? Do you track any other uh, supplemental type of duties? No, sir, we don't because typically those people are employees of the school. Okay. But if they are volunteers coming in and serving the school and they're not our employees, they should be approved as a volunteer. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm sorry. You kind, of, <laughs> you kind of caught me off guard. Okay. Now, did you say a volunteer as, a, as an employee of the school? Because I thought we... Certified employees. So we have certified employees who can, who can assist with the sport because they, they're paid a salary. We do not allow our classified, classified. staff okay. to serve I mean, volunteers that, because that we was, get into okay. wage and hour well, issues and we've just made the determination several years ago not to do that. Well, I mean, and the reason I was asking is because on a Friday night there's 15 to 20 running yes, up and down the field acting like coaches. Uh, I didn't know how you clarify that or not. Well, we really have to leave that to the discretion of the school because you're right, and that conversation has come up before because people hold the signs and they do all kinds of things. So the school is supposed to set the limits set the to a allow only certain people on the ground, on the field, to do their task. Some of those people tend to be student uh, managers of that team and stuff. And, and I can remember going, I kept stats, basketball and stuff, so very often they'll teach somebody one of the kids to do that, and they can mark it quite well. Do well, mm -hmm. some of those people you see very well may be juniors and seniors or something doing well, that it, same thing. It, it, it's something to be very difficult to monitor, but at the same time, the interpretation by one school versus another could give a school an a unfair advantage because they push the envelope. Can we say it that way? What? And I understand what you're saying, but. Uh, uh, by calling something else. Um, it, it's also dangerous over there on the sideline. I mean, you know, broken legs have been numerous. And uh, I, I just wonder, you know, how, if we're getting too many out there. Well, but again, you said that's, that's not something we have tracked, but we have just told them they have to limit their number of volunteers who assist with coaching. Okay. Mr. Aldo. Has there ever been a, I know there's a job description for each of these positions as it exists on its standard, but for the duties that are related to these percentages, um, has there ever been a, a description of what those duties are? Not to my knowledge. And the percentages pretty much have been based upon the time that it takes to be involved in that particular activity. Is well, that correct? And, and these were all negotiated back in the days of a negotiated contract. All of these were negotiated. We haven't made any changes since the contract with the REA ended. 
So these have been in place for quite a long time. All we did over time was to add to the list and occasionally increased a, a percentage. So this, this percentage is based on a BS and five years experience. So when we calculate the formula, you take BS and five years and you find that salary and you multiply that percentage and that determines the amount. So even if they have credentials beyond that, the supplement is only on the BS and five. Correct. Anybody else on this? We'll skip over number 15. Uh, number 16, you say? 16 would be tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow night, 16. Uh, well, we're on general discussion right now, and then we'll let Ms. Nolan go after that. In general discussion? Just that uh, I think we were fortunate across the state for two. Uh, initiatives to have not come to fruition, uh, the statewide charter and the uh, state right authorization in the, uh, in the voucher bill. So you know, they certainly will be back next year as the uh, elected superintendent and some of the other burrs in our saddle, but uh, they certainly aren't gone and in our due diligence is to uh, stay in touch with our our elected officials that represent us on the state level to convince them that none of those three uh, initiatives are, are good for, for education. In part having to do with uh, item 16 on the agenda, uh, our board meeting of March 14th and potentially the board meeting tomorrow night may have visitor comments that I've become aware of uh, you know the possibility of citizens who may come tomorrow evening uh, I took it upon myself to contact uh, at least one of those individuals and explain to them that the traditional typical manner of the board is to receive those visitor comments at the beginning of the board meeting and not enter into a dialogue uh, with the visitor and then it is uh, Tomorrow night, item 17, general discussion by the board members where we anticipate or one could anticipate that a board member might have something to say uh, about the visitor comments or anything else. Um, I think that that's important for the general public to understand and I think that we may uh, avoid some of the uh, backlash that we experienced uh, March 14th if we can somehow make the public aware that it's at that item 17 when they may anticipate uh, a board member uh, to address those concerns, but certainly not at item six when visitor comments are. Um, hopefully that word can get out and if you attend board meetings on a regular basis, you come to understand that. We actually met an hour and a half today, Mr. Zago and I, with the lady and a couple of representatives and talked about they asked some questions, gave them some of the same information that we've got, try to clarify some of the requirements of the state and that sort of thing. So we, we, uh, we listened a long time. It's about an hour and a half today that we did that this morning. And, you know, we have in our board policy that where we go and uh, experience uh, additional <laughs> training activities, uh, all of the board members uh, went to the National School Board Conference. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit in on uh, another presentation by uh, Bill Daggett uh, who was instrumental in the Common Core preparation uh, through his foundation and uh, some explanation of that and we continue to be vigilant to understand and, and have an impact on uh, how that and many other issues of education are, are being prepared for the future. To that end, uh, a point that I want to make sure that we as a board have addressed appropriately, and I, I feel confident we have, is that of concussions with uh, football. That's a, that's a, that's a, has got national news and notoriety, and just want to be affirmed, at least, that, that we have done everything that we need to do to position our coaches and other personnel, frankly, 
that they're, they're very aware of the procedures there. So maybe a new statute that came through this time, but I haven't seen them all. There was one introduced. Mm -hmm. Deal with that in the legislature, but I did, I don't know that I've seen the final I, I version saw it. of that. Okay. Concussions. Did it pass? I think so. no, I'm sorry. Concussions about student concussion oh, athletes. I, haven't seen the final version. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I'm asking from our standpoint. Are we doing our due diligence to be sure that appropriate training is, has been is being done and has been done to not only protect our kids, but also protect ourselves? I'm pretty confident that's a requirement in the statute that that, 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 so. that those individuals have to be trained. It has to be a uh, licensed doctor. a licensed physician or that, uh, to to examine before that that child or student can can reenter practice what or we're doing all that. Yeah. but uh, you know TSSAA when it first year it came out they required a doctor uh, and they had to sign it and bring the note to the officials last year they relaxed that and said oh anybody can sign it don't even have to hand it to the officials there's nothing we can do about it so if they want to send one back in with the eyes whirling around or whatever they we have to let them in well, and, but it's not the TSSAA official's job to do our job. Our job True. is to make sure our coaches understand that. True. Because our coach and our system is the one going to get sued, not TSSAA. And, 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 and rightfully so. So, and, I mean, I, I, I applaud, right. frankly, the fact that TSSAA stays out of it. I think it is the job of our coaches to do that. But, but when, it's, uh, when it's picking out who's getting sued, the officials get sued right along with, well, you shouldn't have let him back in. You know, I mean... Uh, it's, uh, and, and you're right, the, our county uh, coaches do a great job in not letting them back in, but other coaches, you have to be careful, other coaches do. Early on when I saw the statute, some of the earlier versions of it, it's going to require a policy or something. There may be some wording that has to go in your policy, so my guess is you're going to be addressing it as soon it, as we see what the It will need to be strong. Be. Uh, wording too, I think. Well, I don't, you know, I don't think we're bound to the, to the whatever is there. We can, we can take that and as our basis point and go beyond that if we right. feel like it's appropriate to do. Uh, but I, I just want that affirmation. I, I felt very comfortable that we were. Anybody else? All right, Miss Nolan, you, you're on stage. <laughs> We'd like to welcome you. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to follow up on some information that I know that Jeff presented to y'all. And I think the discussion here was on the retiree insurance rate. Um, you know, the history, I don't know who all on this board, if you were here in 2000 six or 2007 I don't think so but that was a painful painful time for the county and our health insurance it was also the time when we were implementing a Gatsby standard that required us to determine a cost of what benefits that we offer our retired employees at that time in let me just go back prior to 1999 retirees paid 100% of the insurance rate. In 99, the commission agreed to fund 50% of the premium. The problem was, over time, whenever there was a rate increase, there was not a willingness to pass on the rate increase to the retirees. No different from the discussion we're having today. So we moved from that point to 2005, 2006, that said you have to determine what does it cost to give retirees this health insurance benefit? What does it cost? Well, that's the first time that we did an analytical review and analysis on the rate. And what we found at that time is that the pre-65s were paying their share. The premium that was charged was paying the cost of their cost. The, it was the post-65 folks 
that were not. Where they were supposed to be paying 50% of their premium, they ended up paying 19% when we got down and said, what is the rate that we should be charging? And they were only paying 19%, not 50. So a lot of those folks had been retired for years. And we said, How, we, we just can't do that. We just morally cannot take that kind of a hit to those people. So we started stratifying. And we said, okay, for these people that have retired and been gone, we will now agree to pay 25 or 75% of their premium, of the adequate premium. And I want to make a distinction. An adequate premium as opposed to a fake premium because that's what the premium had evolved into, the rate that we were charging. It had no basis. It was just a number. It would be no different than me coming to you and say, hey, you know, I want insurance, but you know, I only want to pay $300. You say, okay. You know, it didn't matter. I had lots of wrecks. That's just the premium I wanted to pay. So at that point, and it was painful, and it was, it, it, it was not a pleasant time to get us to the point of where we, um, where we are today. And again, Every year, we analyze what is the rate, what sh we should be changing. Um, so some of the discussion I, I, I just had heard is like, we just can't do that. We, we, don't, we want them to blend. I think that was, can we blend them? Okay, so what are you really saying? We don't want the retirees. We've already calculated the rate to be what, it, what has been presented, but we don't want to charge them that rate. We want to charge them a different rate. We want to charge them the rate of the actives by blending them in. <clears throat> to make sure I understand, when you say when you've determined the rate, but that rate is determined by a small 165 mm -hmm. member agree. older group. I agree. I agree. With, and, and I'm 59 myself, and the issues that I have today are not what I had at age 25 and age 35. So I think what we have been trying to figure out is, or, or we've wondered about, why would the pre-65 have been set up? Think of it this way. Think of it this way. And I, you know, I don't think there's any dispute that if we blended everybody and put them in a pool, the rates would be different. But then I, I'm going to say to you, how much does it cost to provide this benefit. If you did not have retirees in the mix, the rate for actives would be the rate for active, right? I mean, if you, if you said, you know, once you retire, you're gone. And I understand, yes, it is a small pool, but the cost of giving the benefit of allowing these folks to be on our insurance plan, the plan is what is designed, how much does it cost to provide that? I mean, I, I, am, I am with you 100%. If we blended them together, it would be a different rate because the, the risk is shared amongst a lot more people. And, and, I, don't, and I don't want to debate, mm -hmm. but to me, this boils down to an issue of fairness, that we have these men and women that have given 30, 35, maybe 40 plus years to our children mm -hmm. in serving the education community. And, and they have been set in this small group mm -hmm. that with having 165 older employees or retirees, if you will, they are going to have some medical issues. And in, in, in the corporate world, that's why you have a large group policy is to, is to blend your younger employees who should have less issues to, to make up the difference between your older, uh, well-established employees and experienced employees and loyal employees to make that rate uh, better, if you will. And, and I just, I don't understand setting up, because if, if Gatsby is the issue, I, I just can't imagine that you still would not be able to account for those individuals in a reporting opportunity, but still 
give them and the entire group the, the benefit of a, of a decent, competitive, affordable health insurance rate. Right, okay, two points. The ones that have retired are loyal employees. You have employees right now who are also building time with this system and our loyal employees that hoped one day to be in the category of the ones that retired. Agree? Certainly. Okay. What GASB required us to do is figure out, again, how much does it cost to give this benefit to people who, when they retire, a health insurance benefit? You've got to figure that out. And then turn around and say, okay, Joyce has been here. Have we recognized that cost that we're going to have to pay in the future for her? We don't. It's an active rate. It's for today. If you are going to factor in a cost to be able to pay those benefits in the future today, you would need to add about $11 million more to your budget, to the current year budget. That's now, this, these numbers I'm quoting are from our last actuarial study. We will have a new one, which is where I'm getting to on what the proposal is because it has an impact. I asked Melissa to just kind of give me some numbers of what would the rates look like if we're blending. Do they have their sheets in front of them? The sheets that you have? Okay. Um, again, it goes back to, I know what you're saying, and I don't dispute, if you blend them all together, the rate is less because it's over all the population. I, I don't dispute that. But I'm trying to get to what does it cost to give a retiree a health insurance benefit? That's, what, that's where we're, we're at with well, this. Well, but see, you're using a term that I, that I don't think should be retiree gives it a different connotation, it is still an, an employee that is under the age of 65. Mm -hmm. and, and we all understand that there's there's federal statutes that apply and, and to I the 65. And I am to that pre-65 group. Right. And Ms. Nolan, it is just blatantly unfair from where I sit. Okay. I, here's what I'm saying, is that what you're, what I'm hearing it is the discussion is we've got a rate that was determined and it is a high rate and we don't want to charge that to our retirees. We want to charge something less, even though the rate that is calculated for that pre-65 group, group, let's say um, on a single, single copay is 848.37. That's what it has been determined, what the pr total premium should be. But for an active, if we blend it, and I hope I'm speaking right to this, is substantially less, $511 a month. That's a difference. Okay, so that's what you would like to be the premium for this group. Accounting wise, <coughs> What we're really saying is the county will pick up that difference between 848 and 511. Because we don't want to charge that to the employee, but it's going to be charged. But you, would you never, but you wouldn't have that rate if they hadn't been placed in a small group. I understand it. I, I, insurance, you're saying it's a risk. I'm saying what is the to provide this benefit to this group of people. If this group of people were not in our insurance plan, if the county was like a lot of other counties in the state of Tennessee, that when you leave it's gone, I mean, we're one of the few counties who offer this benefit. So I'm saying, we're, GASB requires us to determine what does it cost to give this benefit. Does GASB require us to determine it in the categories that we've set up or are these categories that we've set up on our own design? 
Gatsby requires us to determine the cost to give a benefit. It's called OPB, other post-employment benefit. What does it cost to give that? So Gatsby only, does Gatsby only apply to post-employment? Gatsby, Gatsby is a, a rule standards of how we do our accounting. This Gatsby 45 is just one standard that addresses post-employment benefits. For us, that benefit is just health care, but other people, it could be life insurance or other things. That's why it's wrapped up into this other. So GASB 45 only applies to post-employment and our only benefit is health insurance. Right. So that's why it is specific. Now we have chosen to divide that into pre-65 and post-65 because, be because of what you explained at the beginning well, from 1999 well, and past. No. Because somebody who is after after 65, they're now Medicare eligible. That means Medicare is their primary insurance. We become secondary. So the premium is a whole lot less on a pre-65. We just become a secondary policy. Okay. But for somebody who is you know, pre-65, we are it. Was the same calculation method used one year ago? Yes. And so in the course of one year, the pre-65 matrix has, has actuaries have resulted in, an, in a 50% increase yes. in that premium? Yes. Well, actually, you know, I've, I've got some information for you, and this is just comparing 2011 to 2012, and this is, uh, I'll give you these numbers um, for a active, this is a per employee per year per employee per year. 2011 for the medical and pharmacy was 9,600. A pre-65 in 2011 was 11,530. Now for 2012, an active went to 9,796 and our Pre-65 went to four, well, almost $15,000. Ms. Nolan? Sir? <clears throat> From where I sit, what you're explaining to me, and, and, and I'm not refuting any of it, but if we, if, if this county is going to do that, we could do the, Okay, you got the pre-retirees, then we're going to throw everybody from 45 to 55 in a group, and everybody from 35 to 45 in a group and as they grow older that group is going to do worse I, and, it's, and I agree I agree I guess I, I'm not disagreeing with you at all that if we blend them in we put but even if we blend them together we've got to calculate right. what does it cost okay but and and I know Mr. Hodge and I were probably the only board members that were around when Gadsby started uh you know haunting yeah. us the way it has but it, it's an accounting it's it's a reporting uh, it, it is but there is a cost to it too i mean i just the cost is the same. back in 99 and i'll use the school board i had you uh check for me it is a cost in 1999 is when all this we're going to pay half of the rate so in the first fiscal year was the 2000 2001 the budget number for the schools was about 100, 150,000 to pay that 50% of the premium cost. And this is, you know, the benefit was given to everybody who's retired right now, let's go. This is, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna pick up half, 150,000. The number today in your budget today is 1.8 million. There is a cost. But that's, but that that's not cost, accounting. But that cost is, is, is benefit and actuarial related because that, the health insurance from even the corporate mm -hmm. level has, has increased exponentially. So consequently, okay. it's going to affect us also. I guess yeah. I just want to get you to understand that we've got to figure out the cost. Now, I'm just using the numbers that uh, Ms. Stenson gave me, that this is what, we're, what you are saying, this is what I'm hearing you say, is that we don't want, we would like to blend that rate. Though we already have an, 
<coughs> an amount of what they should, what the pre-65 should be paying, but we don't want them to pay that. We want to blend them in and to see what the rate is. So the difference between, if you look on your sheet, uh, $848 a month is what the premium would be for uh, a copay. The difference between that and the employee only portion, that's a cost that we're, the county will be absorbing, that difference. And then the county would be paying half of that $500 rate. So we move from a 50-50 split of the adequate rate, not the rate of blending, but the adequate rate to fund this benefit. We move from 50 to 70%. And that's where, where the county's going to be paying 70% of that cost. But see, that's where I, I find this unfair, that because the rate you're talking about is determined because this 165 person group that is older and is going to experience more health issues mm -hmm. has been segregated from the larger, much, much larger group. But we have segregated them since 99. Can I ask it this way? Yes, sir. I'm 61 years old, retired, mm -hmm. so I will not vote on any of this. I've already made that known. But if I were still teaching, you're saying you would pay less on me than I, you would because I'm retired. It's not going to cost you a dime more. <laughs> Knock on wood, you had not paid a nickel on me in 40 years. It's, I go back to Lois Miller and her information that she gave to us. And that was people who are in that 55 to 65 age or pre-65, they're healthier if they stay working than if they are at home. Well, so you need to come back to work. Back to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, you, I mean, seriously? I mean, we're, we're saying that someone 61 years old that is working right now is less of a risk than I am? I'm just saying that I'm, I'm just saying what was said to me. And well, I've I'm already admitted I'm not very smart, so I don't figure that one out either. <laughs> and again, I'm just going back to what we what we experienced in 0506 when we really had to drill down and we had to come up with what does it cost us, the county, to give this benefit? Because now what happens if this is the the course that we're on is that we don't want to give this much of a cost to the retirees, then we turn around and, and I have to report this to my actuary, not the actuary that figures the rate, but the actuary who now is going to determine how much is that now gonna cost in the future for current active employees that when they hit that point, the county is not gonna be, it's not gonna be a 50-50, it's now gonna be a 70-30. Basically, you're, you're telling the, the employee that maybe burn out after 30 years of teaching. Oh, you might as well stay teaching till you're 65. You know that's. You so know that's, it's not. It's not that's just, just a what teacher. you just said. I, I did, it, but it's not just a teacher. It's a sheriff's deputy. It's other people in. It's, but, they're all over. Yeah, but that's what all you're saying. All so over. Yep, yeah, I'm saying. Look, I'm in that boat too where I may have 30 years in a couple of years, that's gonna to have to be a, a decision. Mm -hmm. I just, <clears throat> I still think it's, it's unfair to, to these individuals I, that I, they've I been understand. separated out. I understand, I'm just saying that if this is the <clears throat> way that, that if the insurance, I'm not a voting member of the, I am not a voting member, I am just a report the numbers girl. What is the cost? Have we sat down and figured out what the actual cost is? If we do, Linda? I haven't. No, I had. That's. I just called my actuarial. To, well, I think um, before we say no to, to this, say we need to really what, what is the cost? Look at the I'll, I don't know if I'll have it this week or not. But anyway, there is a. You know, in the short term, again, it's this is what what we're saying, and that's what I'll. You know, I'm sure when you retire, you want like to have seventy percent of the premium paid too. See? Yes. And I hope you don't think we're being mean to you. No, because I, you're and the I don't messenger. take it that way. I don't Good. take it that way at all. I just, you know, it's it's how you hear it you know, and, and then how we have to account for it. Uh, it. Thank you. Former director, Mr. Gill, used to always say, 
you know, a society or in, in a system is judged by how we treat our children. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we're also judged by how we treat our older citizens too. And, 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 and I, you know, I, I'm, I understand, but just don't look at that group. Look at everybody who's still working and then look to them and say, oh yeah, by the way, you're gonna get that benefit. But if you look at the corporate structure, I mean, well, and Mr. Tackett made the point, you know, you got a 61-year-old pre-retiree, pre-65 retiree, but we're going to charge them a, they're going to be charged a heck of a lot more than that 61-year-old that is still working for the system. How many in the corporate world offer health insurance benefits after they retire? But that's not the question. Yeah. I, I, I that, guess I'm that, just that, saying that, you're, that, you're that, bringing up corporate. And I well, just, but I'm that, that doesn't have anything to do with the conversation as I see it. I'm not, I'm not disputing not having. <laughs> I'm just saying we got to account for the cost of it. And, and, and I would what think, is the cost? Well, and, and you'll be able to, the actuaries do what they that's, do. That's what they, they do. They will determine the cost. And that, that's all I'm saying is that we, you've got to be prepared. If this if that's the route we're going, then what we're saying is the county will pay 70% of the premium of the retiree. Not if it's part of the big. I'm saying. No, wait, okay, let's, let's do, um, these folks here in your budget, every category, uh, regular education, special education, you've got a line for health insurance, right? Yes. That's the county's paying. That, that's the county paying that share of the employees. I mean, you're paying, you're paying over there. I'm just saying, account for it and pay and, and pay it over there. And, and, I, and I think the accounting part uh, would, be, would be the easy part. Paying for it is where we... The, the, where all of this, we can account for it. I'm just saying, we, we go from an $11 million to give this benefit to all the employees really cost the system 11, you know, the, the actuary value is $11 million but, that we're not putting any money aside for. But it's... But if we're all, if they're all blended, the claims, the claims and the premiums are all the same. Okay. okay. I, again, yes, when you, you blend it all together, but I, if I come to you and I say, Wayne, how much does it cost to give retirees health insurance? How much does it cost? What would you do? What's their claim cost? It costs this much to $3 million. That's the cost of their claim. So, so Gadsby makes you take each individual age and determine the cost of insurance? It requires me to determine how much does it cost to give retirees health insurance. From your 18, 19 year old classified employee to all the way up to bud breaks yes. they have retired. So you're... So all this that we're talking about has an impact on future retirees, not just the ones here and not just the ones that we're talking today, but your future ones coming. Well, if you're going to, if we're going to continue, mm -hmm. if they're going to mm -hmm. continue to see 50 and plus percentage rate, you won't see any pre-retirees. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something that I am not an expert in right here. And, and, you know, I've got a really good friend who is in that boat. And so the decision is I may come to your business and see what kind of rate I can get. Go out in the market. I don't know. You, but you, you can't, at, the, at, at our age, you can't go into the market because pre existing. Uh, on, on an individual basis, you can't jump into an individual market and expect to have a decent rate. At in one one fourteen, that's out. Pre-existing goes away at one one fourteen. Well, I'm not sure what actually does happen when one fourteen goes. Okay. There's a supposedly lot. Supposedly, yes. on one one fourteen, yeah, pre-existing goes so, away. Okay. Supposedly. Supposedly, we'll see as it 
Yes, ma'am. Did you say a moment ago that in 1999 the cost of this was 150000 For the school board in their budget for 2000-2001 was about $150,000. Okay. And in 2013 we're looking at $1.8 million. In the current year, you're at 1.8. I think Jeff has estimated 2.2 for next fiscal year. Okay. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about just the county contribution for retiree, whether current, ones. current retirees, whether pre-65 or post-65. Correct. Okay. But the program in 1999, it actually cost 300000 Am I correct? Because our contribution was 150,000. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Okay. The cost was if our contribution is 1.8 million, what does the program cost? Um, the whole health insurance. We're no, one, just the just pre-65, the, the pre post-65, the equivalent number to the 300,000 in 1999 that said our intent in 99 was a 50-50 split. Yeah, I went. Where have we evolved to? Because we're not 50-50. We're, we have been 50-50. But we're 25-75 on... On some, yes. I mean, grandfathered. on the grandfathered ones who are post Our intent 65. in 1999, when we said this was an okay idea, was to be 50-50, and it was 150000 for a $300,000 expense. Today, right. we're at $1.8 million for a fill-in-the-blank expense. 3.6. It should be 3.6. Truly? Yes. But we're at 75% contribution. No, 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 no. Uh, you only have a small group that you are paying 75%. But if we're paying 75% for one, it ought not be 1.8 million times two, 3.6. Yeah, because I doubled it. You're probably a little more. I, I don't have that number. <clears throat> I, mean, I, really I just that. wonder. I just wonder why are we not moving from 1999 to 2013? If we got off track at 2005 and realized it, if we got off track at 2002 and realized, why are we not moving back to a 50/50? No, we did. That's what I'm saying. In 2005, 2006, when we had to adjust and we worked our way. Now we do have a small segment when when we agreed that we would not. Big. We have 281 and 106, I mean, that's what I'm seeing on this spreadsheet, is 281 grandfathered post-65 and 160-some pre-65. Pre so, so that's of like... That, of that post-65, you will have a group that you are paying 75%. Why are we not moving back to 50%? Because these are people who, I mean, they're 80 and they have, I mean, that was a decision on this small group of people, that's what I'm saying, it evolved into, it was supposed to be 50-50, but it was a fake rate. So once we got the rate, we said we cannot do that to these people. So we will recognize, we brought them up a little, and they are paying 25% of the rate. And the county's paying 75 for this segment. So was the, it fake in 1999 and their 50% really wasn't 50%? I don't know what it was. I don't. I would like to think it was a real rate in 99. And so from 99 to 2005, when we realized, 2004, yeah. 2005, when we realized the error and it had, it had digressed to 17% that you said just a moment ago, then we said, oh, we can't go from 17% back yeah. to 50%. Right. We'll just go to 25%. 25. Right. But since 2005, we haven't made any more we progress have. to oh, get yes. back to 50%. No. Okay. Again, it's you stratify that group of people who are post-65, and you grandfathered some. You grandfathered this post-65, and you said, this group, you will remain, and you pay 25. Now, this next group, we started coming up and said, okay, now, y'all are coming on. You're going to be paying 50. Those are the non-grandfathered okay. post-65. Kind of late at our meeting, I sent y'all an email at our budget meeting last week. That document shows it is the grid. It's four or five pages, and it shows the different groups. That grandfather group who had to have 30 years by a certain date, they're in that 75% bracket. We, we stratified it, like Lisa said, depending on how many years of service you had with us, this was the package 
included in your retiree benefits and the percentage you would pay. And then there's a, there was another group, those people who, who were 65, still working, yeah. but we, you know, we didn't want to affect them either. We didn't want them all retiring. Like, because that was a concern. It's like, oh my gosh, if we do this and we say 50%, yeah. you know, you're gonna have some good teachers leave and you don't want them to leave. So we said, okay, we will work into 50%. And it was <coughs> over a five year period of time that we would get them to 50% of the premium. So we have done that on our post 65s. Who aren't grandfathered? Who aren't grandfathered and may still be working today. Is the same consulting group working for us today that helped formulate into the actives and the pre-65 retirees and then the grandfathered and non-grandfathered? I mean, are, are, do we still have those? In we have, okay, two different groups that we work with. One group, which is Cigna, our current group, and Cowan Benefits, work to set the rates. That's one group. Our other group is the same group that we've worked with at the beginning. They've changed, they used to be CCA strategies and then they were bought by Bradford, JCC Bradford, and now they've been bought out by Aon. They've been Aon, same person that we work with. She's the one who determines and calculates the actuarial cost of giving this benefit to the future. What is the cost or actuarially, or is it actual required contribution as far as my audit? Y'all don't really ever see that number. That's that number, that's $11 million. And I think Jeff's saying about a million dollars that is a cost to the system that we don't recognize, we're not calculating. Here's the difference. I'm you're not a teacher, but th those that are teacher that are um, a member of TCRS. Okay. okay, actuarial study is done every two years for that program as well. They determine what we pay, have to pay as a percentage of salary, and we pay it based on that actuary. This is how long these people are gonna live, this is what they're making, this is what they project when they quit working, this is what they're gonna get, this is how long they're gonna live, this is what we're gonna pay out, roll back. This is what the cost is today for us, it's 12, 69% of payroll. And we pay it. That same theory is done on OPEB. It says if you want to, what we should be doing is putting this money aside to be able to pay benefits in the future for you. You're not ready to retire but to be able to pay you in the future. We should be putting money aside. We don't. We tried, we tried to build balances and we were making some headway to start being able to fund our future costs. But the, we ha the fund, the insurance fund had a loss in 2012 of $2.6 million. That has nothing to do with OPEB and whatever, premiums. We're on track to have another loss this year. So part of this discussion is our premiums are not at a level that they should be. Not even counting this um, stuff in the future. Today, we don't have enough premiums. I just contrasted. We don't do the same thing for our employees with their post-employment benefits as we do their pensions. We fund the pensions, but we do not fund the post-employment benefit of insurance. I would think as a, <clears throat> as a teacher coming out of the university setting looking for a career that, uh, you know, if that's, if that's the way we're going to treat uh, our pre-65 retirees, I would think that would make us a much less attractive profession. You know, it, it's, it's a decision. The decision you have to make is what are we gonna charge our retirees and what's it gonna cost to do that? 
I mean, to and, me, that it gets down to well, that simple. And, it, and, and the answer to that is, at some point, we need to know exactly what it would cost to blend mm -hmm. those 165 pre-retirees, pre-65 retirees, into what do we have? 4,000. How many? How many employees do we have across the? It's about 4,700 on insurance. Okay. So, so 4,700 like total, and put 165 mm -hmm. in their claims into the big. They'll be able to determine that factor pretty quick, I would think. But, I, but accounting wise, even if you blend that rate, and blend all day long, I'm going to look at all the pre 65 and say this is the cost of their claims. But but this that'll be different, but Miss Nolan. That'll be oh. different every year. It is. That's why you have these. That's why some years some years they may do very well, and some years they may not. And you can see, for the last two years. They have been bad. Okay. So, so is that trend, or is that is well, that something? You know, I, my crystal ball is not any better than yours, I guess. Sure. But uh, I mean, that's that's the whole theory in the law of large numbers that 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 cures a lot of the ills by by having the big pot. I, you know, and, and we go back back again is what is the what is the rate? But then I go back to because of Gatsby reporting standards. I got to find out how much does it cost to give that retiree a benefit separate from what does it cost for Metro active employees. Metro Police have been on heightened alert in the wake of the tragedy in Boston. <laughs> so I mean if I said what is the rate if we if that benefit was not given at all what is the rate or what is the cost and then you add but if our retirees come in this is the cost to give the benefit. I understand where you're going is that, yes, I'm not disputing that when you blend the people, it is the same, but you still, even if you blend, I got to drill down and say, okay, but to give the benefit to retirees, even if you blend it, this is the cost. It goes back to their claim. But it's, it's, it's more of a, in our situation, what we're looking more is uh, the cost of the increase, the, the percentage of increase. You know what you charge is one thing, but but hitting them over the head with an absurd increase is is what I think we we've, we've all been talking about. Is I mean the rate is what it's going to be because you know it's all based on age and a lot of times gender, right. and uh, uh, it, it's the percentage of increase that that has disturbed us. And, and that's what and, and, that's what that's the crux of our issue, I believe. I think I think I'm saying it correctly. And, and that's fine. I just get back to what are we going to charge, and how much of that premium is the county going to fund? Okay. You know, if the, if we you know based on the analysis of Cigna and and Callan and Melissa, this is what the rate should be for pre sixty five. Yeah, Wait a minute. I, no, I know. But I'm saying you, but it goes down to this is what it costs. For me, this is what it costs. But, but, it, but it's that way because it, they were separated and they're... But they've and, always been separated. Mm -hmm. And their rates have, previous to this year, the rates have covered it. Actually, not really because last year it didn't cover it. But I mean, industry-wide, you know, for the last several years, the rates... Mm -hmm. For health insurance, it's climbed exponentially, uh, for whatever reason, and I, I certainly don't know all the reasons. But uh, uh, well, again, I apologize for talking so much, but I'm. Where this, we see increases in the active employees, are we giving alternate plans yes. that that give options? Yes. What okay. We what we've done I understand that we've got that yes my question really is we see this increase in the pre-65 retirees is there a possibility or a proposal for an alternate plan that would give them the option of some other coverage because I see my you know number one number two number three you know these other premium rates and everything for the active employees but I see kind of one proposal for the pre-65s, and you're going up 50%, it's your only option. You've got two. You've got a copay plan and a deductible plan. You've got two plans. Okay. 
I do see that now, yes. Is, the, is, are one, is one of those a new offering because of the 50% increase? No, I mean, that, that's what we've had. Are there any other? Well, co Yes, that's right. We, oh, he's right. Co-pay or deductible? The co-pay. Co-pay, you're right. Co-pay okay. is new. It, took the re it replaced one other one that, was, that had hard work experience. But it doesn't give them an option of you don't have to go up by 50%. You could take this alternate plan that only goes up 30%. I'm not, I'm not sure you could do that. I'm not sure that you could, you could separate them with, with different coverages like that. Y'all getting in an area that I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm not, not positive about that, but I'm not sure you, you could. I mean, again, I'm not sure that's not another form of discrimination against them. Well, we're offering different plans to the active employees. But so, are, but we offer them too. We've got three plans for the active and three plans for the. We have three people. for the active and two for the. I thought, retirees. Okay, I thought you said we enacted a third one for them also. No, we got rid of one. We've, Jeff, we, we because the, um, the, the H. HRA. Thank you. Thank you. Is only for the actives. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I, I didn't come to sway your mind any which way, but just know that what is decided does have an impact for now and future. Well, I hope you felt welcome. I just love you. Ms. Nolan, I, I'll just say I appreciate you coming and sharing that information with us. And I want you to understand what you do, uh, that we've been pressured by the pre-65. Uh, and and a lot of the group that we're being pressured by are the ones that we're going to retire this year. Mm -hmm. And so now I think there's probably several of them that are, may have different thoughts. And I guess that cost, that pre-65 cost is going to be the same whether we, whether the rate, whether they retire or don't retire. You know, I guess I would, anybody who is pre-65, we do not have a crystal ball about what's going to happen. And, and around this table, I don't know if y'all are going to guarantee what their rate's going to be. It's just that, you know, they've got to be prepared that rates will, you know. But they will for all employees. It will because for all rating, of us. Rate, yes. rates are going to increase. And if, if that is going to sway your decision of should I retire, should I not retire, if that's the siding point, my recommendation to them would be, you know, if if that's the tipping point, maybe you should reconsider. 50% yeah, rate increase would certainly make a difference for me. Yeah, I mean, I just want, want you to know we're, we're not shooting at you. I, <laughs> no, I didn't feel that way. I feel yeah. welcome here. Well, we just, you know, I just felt it's important that yes. you know why we're hammered. And I, and I do, I just wanted y'all to know what the impact is. And I didn't bring this up, but the other piece of it, when we borrow money, and we borrow money for schools, we are rated by two rating agencies, Moody's and S&P. S&P is the group that, that really hammered hard on the mayor and I, on what are you doing with your post-employment benefit? What strides are you making to take care of this issue? Now, on my side, I'm just sweating up here. If we go to 70%, I'm gonna to have to say, we've made it worse. We didn't make it better. We have made it worse. Now that's just, I don't know what, that's not, that's just something that we'll have to deal with if it goes this way. But they are looking, and I know that y'all have heard the same news reports I've had on the governments that are struggling and have problems, and it is because of two issues. It's their pension and their post-employment benefit. All right. I just I appreciate the job you do, and, and uh, well, I see what I, I wouldn't do what y'all do. So. <laughs> I'll go back and do my numbers. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Nolan. Anybody else? Anything further? I guess I'm still a little unclear here. <laughs> are we going to look, ask them to come back with a proposal and tell us what it would cost them to lend? <clears throat> we just. It's, is that possible, Miss Nolan, for us to have some actual hard numbers? What? What it would do to to blend? I mean, I mean that's that's what I'm saying. That's not a problem. Saying what is the blended rate? I'm still going to have to say how much is it cost? How much are we paying toward that premium? 
That's just a reporting issue, right? Yes. It's a reporting. We're looking at cost. We just want to look at cost. That's all we want to look at. We want to know what it's costing us to blend and not to blend. That's the only two things we want to look at. I think what Lisa is trying to say in this blending issue, <coughs> it will affect this liability that we are having to record that's currently at about a million a month. It will help drive it up because the actuaries will go through and look, okay, so you're changing your funding to 3070 instead of 5050. And I, that, that's, I think, the, that, that is in our final financial statements that the county issues, which includes the school board, of course. But, but I guess I'm, the way I would look at that is maybe we'd want to look at going 40, 60. Or there's so, ways to balance this out. And I think you're active. I just talked to a 30 year old active teacher. She said, you know, I'd rather pay more now and pay less later than I had, you know, to pay less now and pay more later. And, and that is the theory that GASB 45 is trying to push our governments to. And when I was in private industry, we went through this in the 90s where we had to start recording this cost. We've got to draw a line somewhere. I mean, we've got, we got a problem here. If we don't correct it, it's only going to get worse. Well, that's the, and that's the point. But let me ask, if you raise how much the county pays, then that's going to put the county deeper in a hole that we're not funding for, right? Right. So, but, we're not funding. But we're not, we're not going to be paying more. It's still the same money. Those people are there. The claims are there. It's just that they're going to be part of a larger pool that everyone is going to share. So we're not, we're not, it's not costing the county any more money. It is just keeping that particular group that has been basically disenfranchised out of the big group. And because they're now older and they have health issues, now they, their premium versus their claims will sometimes and maybe for the last two years, earn them a, uh, a higher premium. But that doesn't. But, but let, let me ask this then. I mean, if you take the pre-65 and put them in with the active and it balances out, it could, it could raise the active's oh, premium too. We'll raise it. So, we'll raise I mean, we'll, we'll be having to pay more on active. On that's why, I'm, that's why I keep going back. You'll have to raise more on the active. The cost is still there. It's just spread around. It's spread. Yeah. But the cost is still there. And then we, we'll have to do So we're, we're asking the actives who may be 21, 22 years old, who never went to the doctor that year, to pay part of the share for the older pre-65. But that is the theory of insurance. That's why you have insurance there is to share the risk. Mm -hmm. the that's why that's why we're not spring chickens anymore. And that's why we're hopeful that's happening. I'm gonna get my I'm gonna get my fair share out of I'm gonna go out and get my money. All right, Miss No. Thank you. Hopefully we can let you rest now. Uh, I guess between now and tomorrow night, you got strong feelings one way or another, bring them with you, I guess. That's all day. Mr. Chairman, we have not covered item six because that's a highlight of Holloway High School. I certainly understand that. We didn't cover item 15. We were given that packet of information tonight. And we didn't cover item 16. And I just want to be clear that you had that basically in your handout on the budget night. I do understand that we have been given a, a preview of that. but. The idea that the items that we not cover on the agenda are things that we just accept without discussion or we're informed about, um, I personally don't anticipate that to be the case with item 16. I anticipate discussion of that, and if it's appropriate for that to happen in work session rather than in board meeting, I just wanted to raise that issue. The reason, the reason we, the reason we did number, uh, jump over these items, as you know, Spotlight, Holloway's not here. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
15, we never discussed those work sessions. Right. And 16, I questioned Mr. Odom on that, and, and he requested we do it tomorrow night. So, right. Uh, just in a sh nutshell, that's why they. Understood. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't skip over it intentionally. It's just uh, Mr. Odom wanted to do it tomorrow night. So. If we got a crowd coming, I'd rather them, if we do them for that, then let's just let them see it. Okay. If that's okay. Uh, can I thank Ms. Nolan again for coming? And, and I apologize. I, I didn't mean to talk so much, but this is something that, that I really feel passionate about. And, okay. So. Anything else? Nothing else to say about tomorrow night. All right. Somebody's going to tell me why I couldn't pull up my.